Um, um, good start. So, welcome to this next week's Experts at Work webinar, which is uh, looking at where next for HR business partnering. This session is for members of all three of our networks, as you know. Uh, we are recording this session just to confirm. And a big welcome to Glenn Templeman, who is author of HR, the HR Business Partner Handbook, Future of HR Consultant at Deloitte, and previously in HR BP roles in the public, private, and not for profit sectors, which obviously is quite unusual, actually. Nice, really nice um, and interesting spread of experience there. So, Glenn's looking at 20, 25 minutes of thinking and ideas, followed by uh, five minutes around a question uh, he's asking everyone with his colleague, Anna. We're going to use menti.com for that. I say we, I mean they. Um, and with a bit of discussion off the back of that as well, followed by some um, more ideas and thinking and 10 minutes at the end for Q&A and, Q and, and discussion <coughs> with the half finish at 12.45. So send us questions and suggestions via the chat throughout. Please put yourselves on mute for now, if you would, if you haven't already. Um, and Glenn, the floor is yours. Welcome again and thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Richard. Um, it's really great to be here with you all this afternoon to um, talk about my, it sounds sad when I say this out loud, but talk about one of my favourite subjects. Um, so uh, hopefully there's other people who um, uh, equally en enjoy this subject and thinking about um, business partnering and, and the future. So um, just a there we go um so thank you richard for the for the intros and um, just a, a a couple of introductions um to me and and my background so um as richard said I, i've written a book called the hr business partner handbook and, I, and i'll tell you about that briefly in a moment um in my day job and um, i'm part of our hr consulting practice at deloitte in london um, and focus on working with government and public sector um clients which is something that I, I really enjoy and, and probably reflects most of my sort of industry um, experience. So um, it's great to, to, to be in that space. And our practice um, at, at Deloitte, our HR practice, we, we actually have um, people deployed across um, private sector and uh, financial services as well. And we, we kind of, we do a couple of things uh, in terms of thinking about um, helping HR um, functions to transform and develop, um, and then also running kind of the delivery programs um, where required as well. But one of the things that we do spend some time thinking about and talking to our clients about is the, is, is the future. So we're thinking about the future of HR, the future of work, um, and the future of the workforce and, and what this means. Um, and so the, the kind of um, career introduction, I suppose, to me is that I think I spent most of my career um, at wanting to be a business partner and uh, realizing that goal and being a business partner and uh, spending uh, some time doing that at different organizations in different sectors and, and then i guess kind of rethinking business partnering and thinking um how, how could it work how should it work and, and how should we be doing this so that's some of the stuff that i'm going to share with you this afternoon just i promise to keep it brief but um the uh the the book was that my focus for for writing um well, for writing anything, to be honest, I always say that I'd never really have written anything more than an email. So I'm as surprised as the next person that I've managed to write an entire book. But but my focus really here was was thinking um, about how business partners can go about doing the, the important work that they do and be successful uh, and really less upon uh, what it is business partners do and what they should be doing, but actually a heavy focus on what are the principles needed um, for, for operating and for, for how to be successful in this role. And I guess for me personally, I was quite fortunate at the beginning of my career to have some really good um, insightful and thoughtful people around me who impressed some of these principles upon me. Um, and those are things that I guess I've been able to develop over time um, and then hopefully use to, to help other people. So that's how that's how I kind of got to that that point. So just thinking about today, um, we're going to run through in this session and um, a little bit about the business partner role and how it's changed or developed since its introduction. And um, so I'm going to run through some of the things that um, happened and, and were apparently in our future and then and then came to reality to help us think about change and think about the future. We're then going to consider um, some of the future trends or things that are happening now we expect to happen in future that are most likely to impact um, the role of business partners and to be honest, the, the workforce and, and wider HR as well. And then we'll get into what I'm calling the past, present and future business partner trends. So 
some real um, uh, down into the detail about what we think that that really looks like um, and some of the things that that may be coming in future. And um, the good news about this session, as Richard has mentioned, is um, you don't have to uh, take my word for it. You get your own opportunity to contribute as we go. So we're going to be running um, a mentee throughout and there'll be questions. So at the end, we're going to review all of your inputs and your thoughts and have some discussion about that. And then we've got time for Q&A at the end. So um, you may have seen um, already and the, the, the keen ones and the early adopters amongst you may already have done this. But if you can grab your mobile device um, or via your laptop and um, whatever's easiest for you, go to menti.com and use the code 66391202. So when you go to menti.com, it should pop up with a box and you're just able to put in the code. Um, hopefully, as a post pandemic people, you're all well, um, well versed in, in Mentimeter by now. Don't worry if you haven't quite got there yet or if you've missed the code. It's going to be at the top of each slide as we go through. So I will do my best to, to, remind, to remember to prompt you um, to answer the questions, but do keep an eye on Menti. The, the questions are going to change um, as we move through the slides. So just to um, just to get us going, I think one of the things that um, having spent, as I've said, most of my career as, as working in and around business partnering, it's um, it can be hard sometimes to think how's this going to change? How's this going to be different? And what's the future going to be like? So actually to help us do that, I've kind of built my own reflections on, on my journey of business partnering. So we could we can kind of remember um, what was once future and is hopefully now um, well and truly present or, or past in some cases. Um, and I do just have to point out, obviously, um, I, I wasn't in the workforce in, in 1997. I hope that's obvious. Um, but I did join. Um, I did join the HR profession in 2001. So I kind of um, closely mirror the, the business partner journey. So going back to 97, I'm sure um, most of you are aware of this. The, the concept of a business partner was born. Um, so it wasn't a book about business partnering that Dave Ulrich wrote, but it but it was in there. Human resource champions. And I think one of the, the my earliest memories and one of the things that, that I saw, I'm sure many of you recognise, was this um, what we call rebadging. So personnel becomes HR, and personnel officers become or personnel advisors slowly morph into HR business partners. Um, and some might say we then spend the next 25 years sort of unpicking that um, that rebadging exercise. And um, one of the first things I remember in the early noughties, um, and it, it, I can't remember exactly, maybe it was 2002, 2003 or, or four. There was a people management magazine cover that talked about um, having a seat at the table. So there was this big shift towards um, uh, HR directors or heads of HR and um, this role being augmented and enhanced into this CHRO role and, and it's kind of funny to think about now but but back then I, I, I my personal experience the CHRO wasn't all that common so this this kind of uplifting of, of the HRD role had the effect of allowing business partners more headroom to operate and to kind of repitch themselves to work alongside director level colleagues and move away from um, perhaps the, the old personnel model of servicing middle managers and um, so that was the kind of first big change that that I it was significant to, to remember and um, being strategic I mean, this is sort of my journey. I think there's um, there's something correct about this being in the middle of this slide. You could put it at the beginning, the end, and absolutely throughout. And uh, and I think um, it's key. It's always been key about how business partners move away from um, transactional, operational type work, the stuff that I would call niff naff and trivia, um, and really focus down on strategic activity and, and what on earth does that mean and how do I make a strategic contribution have a strategic mindset and we're going to talk more about that soon but I, as I say there the battle continues to rage for business partners to become more strategic I think that's our most commonly asked question um, that, that we hear and um, outside in was the next one for me that I think is really and um, really important um, and a kind of key change personally so going this idea that actually business partners need to operate not just as an internal consultant or internal facing but in terms of what business partners know and think and do they've got to consider the external 
business environment, industry sector environment, what's going on in the external world, obviously we've seen in the last couple of years, and build all of those things into the solutions that, that business partners are providing and developing. And so for me, this was a, an idea that no longer is the business partner just an internal provider of static services. Um, and then finally, this idea of actually starting stuff, initiating change. So business partners um, uh, and probably the whole HR function moving from um, purely sort of delivery to actually identification of problems, development or, and delivery of solutions. So this idea of initiating and sustaining people change program and I think this is a great conversation for people that are in um, financial services potentially as well this idea of um, is HR still a back office function or has it moved to the middle office or, or, or somewhere else on, on that spectrum in terms of what HR and business partners are doing and leading and developing so that's just a bit of, of my reflections on the things that have changed over the time and the things that were um, once in our in our future to help us think about um, the future um, now, we're just going to spend a bit, a couple of minutes thinking about, the, I suppose, the world that we live in now, the, the world of work and the external environment and, and, and what type of trends could impact upon the future of business partnering and the future of how um, the world of work and, and how we do HR, essentially. So I, I won't pick through um, everything on here, but, but we will look at um, a, a couple of things. And thinking about data analytics and, and AI, some of you may, um, may be using these things already, but the technology that we, we've got now in this space, with whether it's chatbots, AI, or RPA as it's known, robotic process automation, there's lots of um, technological solutions now to um, solve people's um, challenges and answer their questions and solve their, their problems. So if, if you know or you are a business partner who finds themselves answering things that perhaps um, our employees could sometimes find on the internet or they could read a document, and um, things, things like chatbots and, and the use of robotic process automation is actually going to completely revolutionise um, the way that that, that can be can be managed and no longer do we have such a heavy requirement for uh, human interaction. So, that, so there's, there's a huge piece there um, and lots more coming that I have to confess I, I don't really understand, but but lots of, um, uh, of, of that AI type activity that has a huge impact upon um, the workforce. And to, to blend this across to the consumer experience box, I think you only have to think about when something goes wrong with Amazon or Deliveroo or, or one of these types of organizations and you jump on the help function in the app um, and you ask, you just type what your question is or you type your problem uh, and quite quickly something comes back and, and says something and there's a range of options and a couple of clicks and with Amazon or Deliveroo and, and you've got your refund or you've solved the problem about where your food is and that's chatbot, a chatbot's AI and, R, and RPA and in, in, in real life like happening today. And so something to think about is this the idea of the consumer experience. So how how is that experience of being a consumer um, affecting our, our workplace expectations? The idea of anytime, anywhere, and as much as we like as a consumer. And I often think about um, groceries in, in this space, about if you think of the spectrum over time where I can remember growing up and uh, my, my mum would take me to the supermarket for you know, a good hour and a half on the weekend and we go and pick all the food that we were going to have for the week. Um, there's various iterations over time, but but now I, I go in an app on my phone and the groceries arrive in, in my house, at my door in 10 minutes, and I might do that a couple of times a day. Um, I probably shouldn't admit to that, should I? <laughs> Very environmentally friendly, potentially. So yeah, coming round neatly onto climate change, um, uh, again, for organisations, um, the, the impact of moving to net zero and, and and sustainability and and actually this is something that was has obviously been around for years but we haven't um been been talking about or focused on as as much as we are now and many organizations have plans now to to get to net zero um, and something we're finding at um deloitte is is talking now about green jobs and green skills so um, green skills are um, the skills required to be able to deliver on sustainability goals. Um, so some of these skills that are needed within the organisation. But green jobs is actually something, if, if I were to say to you all on the call, 
what does an accountant do or what does a health and safety manager do and what does your facilities management team do you'd be able to answer that question because it's so well understood and so ingrained well actually we're going to have these green jobs we believe coming in in the future um, in the same way that we have those types of departments um, that are actually going to be focused on delivery of, of climate change at an organisational level and, and driving net zero. So there's, there's more big changes there. Might skip over economic conditions. Um, I don't want to bring the mood down. I think we're all well versed with um, what's going on there. Um, thinking about generational shifts, um, th there's such um, there's a greater spread of generations in the workforce now than ever before. Um, some of you will remember the age discrimination legislation being removed in 2006, uh, no retirement age, uh, and obviously we're many years on from that um, from that now. But one of the things I'd like to pull out from here is that there's there's definitely some generations that are in the workforce that are thinking, how long can I do this job for? Um, how many years can I do it for until I get what I need at the end, which is usually my retirement and my pension? Um, whereas actually the generations coming into the workforce today are influenced so heavily by um, entrepreneurship, the gig economy uh, and, and having um, the type of, of work that's enriching that I think people are starting to shift towards saying, how do I find work that I can do forever? Uh, and so we've got a fundamental shift, but in our workplaces, all these generations are, are kind of coming together. And um, which is also the point about portfolio careers um, at, at the bottom and how people are chopping and changing so frequently. And you all know about the great resignation um, as well. Um, I don't want to talk about COVID, um, but I think what's interesting around um, global events is, is actually thinking about um, what would our response be to a, a kind of future global event. So I'm rattling through because I want to get to the good stuff. Um, but that's perhaps a, an overview of um, some of the trends um, that are happening here. So um, I'm sure you've been doing this in the background, but one of your tasks on Menti is to kind of rank these and um, by which you think is, is the most impactful on the future of business partnering. So here we go. Um, what, um, what I've kind of spelt out here at the top about future business partner trends is I should say, for someone like me, it is really difficult to conceptualise something completely new about business partnering without kind of ripping up what we know about the traditional model of how HR would run. So when I tried to, to build this and design this, my focus was very much on um, evolution, not revolution. Um, but hopefully somewhere in the mix from left to right, we do see a little bit of, of revolution. So again, on Menti for this slide, as I'm working through, do you um, do rank and rate them by which the future trends by which you think are that are going to be the most important um, and also I think there's an opportunity for you to, to rate yourself as well um, shortly or, or rate your organisation perhaps if that's more comfortable um, on where you think you are on this past present future spectrum. So thinking about the first one, the service provider, um, I've, I've sort of alluded to this already when we think about business partners, we, we've gone from a place of uh, simply providing a, a sometimes transactional, well-prescribed menu of services, delivering that to the business, and, and, and that's all it is. And now hopefully what we've got in the present case is business partners who I would say are service designers. So business partners who are so well embedded and understand their organisations so well and their HR functions that they're able to design services that are tailored for their organisation and, and that work really well. I'm going to come back to, to future at the end. Um, in the past, hopefully some of these phrases are familiar, finger on the pulse, the second one, and we've talked about that for many years, the business partner being the person that has that, that awareness of what's going on in the business, to what I think this should be today, which is, um, and I like grand language, I should say, when it comes to business partners, because I, I think business partners are, are fantastic. So chief people storyteller. So actually the business partner being the right person who has the right uh, relationships, knowledge and insights to weave together seemingly disparate and strange events that are happening in a business and actually bring them together into a coherent story that enables that business to then use that narrative to develop solutions to bring change. So that's the role of, of the chief people storyteller and I think that's what business partners should be today. Um, a little bit like service provider and um, the delivery of HR initiatives. So the rollout of succession planning and talent management, for example, taking things from the, from the organization and pushing them out into the business. And um, actually this, this kind of 
being well placed um, to morph into a people change project lead. So actually business partners that are much more focused on the delivery of people change projects and have that um, that this that skill and those disciplines to become part of um, organizational change teams and lead all of the people elements. It seems like a natural progression for me. Um, uh, again, I think this is an, another natural progression. Number four, taking a holistic view um, and moving into a to developing a strategic mindset. So kind of being able to see the whole picture is the holistic view, but but then actually really thinking strategically. And and I, I'm a, a bit of a proponent of this. So, so I always say, you know, you can't just sort of be strategic or do strategic stuff. It has to start with thinking and, and a constant focus in the mind of um, what is a strategic level intervention? How do I develop a strategy to solve this problem? Not a policy or a process or a product, it's, it's a strategy. Um, the, the bottom two, five and six, I might, I'll let you digest, but I might whiz over slightly more quickly for the sake of, of time, but also because I'm, I'm still developing my own thinking on these. So um, very much we've been working with finance um, for, for many years and actually business partners clearly required to have, uh, a, you know, an authoritative level of financial acumen um, and hopefully everyone's um, in that in that place. Um, and then going from systems compliance and um, making sure people fill out the right box on whatever system it is people are using to actually being a technology advocate and uh, and, and kind of really advocating for um, new technological advances and innovations that are going to improve the working lives of the businesses that business partners are serving. So thinking about these future trends and, and what they might mean and these evolutions. So going from this service designer role into what I'm calling HR Augmenter, so actually we've been providing HR services to, into the into the business. We're now tailoring and designing them and actually business partners being at the cutting edge or the lead person to actually come back into the HR function and say, do you know what? Actually, what we need is we need within HR to develop a new capability in X or Y or our business needs us to solve this problem and by doing that we need to develop a capability we need to develop something new so actually what the business partners are well placed i think to do is, is to augment the offering and the capability within the hr function macro social forecaster sounds extremely grand um, and how we've called it accurate, accurate social commentator and future predictor but i reckon most of the business partners on this call and listening to this will have been doing this in the last couple of years your businesses have asked you questions like what should we say to our people about racism what do we do about the safety of women how do we respond to war in europe and so I think those things um, you've already been dealing with, I'm sure many of you are familiar with those those questions. And, and so it becomes beholden upon the business partner as the person who is kind of the people um, function representative who has the intimate knowledge of the business to be able to understand the outside in picture and actually get it right, essentially, in terms of, of advising leaders on how we respond to these wider social issues. Stripey team leader sounds sounds a bit weird, but it's actually around um, thinking about leading change teams and project teams. And so um, actually, and the best business partners do this um, uh, and, and they can be sneaky and do this secretively sometimes, but business partners will grab the um, a talent acquisition person and a reward person um, and, a, and a systems person and kind of bring them together into an informal team because they've got the right skills and the right knowledge at the right time to solve a problem. So actually thinking less in the silos, but really starting to, to break those down and, and developing cross-functional teams. Um, Chief People Architect, some of this stuff probably leads into HR leadership a little bit, which could be a point for discussion. Um, but again, the business partner just being best placed or, or very well placed to initiate and lead the design of people initiative um, and products for um, for the organisation. Um, and then the final two that I, as I said, I'm, I'm still kind of thinking about um, this idea of being a financial custodian. So actually the business partner, thinking about moving from back office to middle office in that example we talked about earlier, um, business partners who can actually create, own and deliver financial value for the business. And, and and that's a, I think that's a that's a very sort of high level high functioning business partner and clearly it's it requires very close working with finance and the finance business partners as well and then as I see the your the um, technology piece develop 
thinking about being an aggressive automator and leveraging AI chatbots and robotic process automation as we've already kind of talked about. But I would say these aren't my strengths, these bottom two, but well, certainly the bottom one. So more, more food for thought there as we move through. Um, I know that's been super fast, but um, I'm going to stop sharing and we're going to whiz across to what you all think. Hopefully be seamless. Yes, I can see it on my screen. There we go. OK, can you? I've got your split screen. Can you just do present? That was it. Yeah, we had it then. Beautiful. Uh, let's jump on to the next one. OK, so ranking the trends. Um, yeah, interesting. I talked for too long about data analytics and AI, didn't I? I might have, um, might have skewed everyone's views. OK, so we've got those tech, consumer experience, generational shift, very close, economic conditions. Climate change always comes out really low. It's funny, isn't it? Um, or something else. Um, OK, so if um if you went for data analytics and AI or tech as as first or second, do you, do you want to come off mute and just tell us what you think about that and um and why that was? Someone's got to be brave. Laura? Yeah. Oh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um well, I just did it uh, really, I suppose, uh, based on my experience at the moment. So I'm an HR business partner um, in the civil service and data and analytics are constantly um, impacting the way I work. And it's, you know, whether that's because the the business that I partner are constantly kind of learning of new ways that they can get insights and data and kind of requesting us to look into that and to, to be able to build them um, insights based on different data sources or whether it's the fact that actually the department that I work in um, has really moved uh, like shifted its model to much more of an HR business partner self-serve kind of model so whereas um, probably even six to 12 months ago, we would receive a number of reports each month and it would be you know, nicely set up in PowerPoint slides with, uh, with the information that we needed to, to give the business. Now everything is via kind of Power BI and various different dashboards, which gives um, you as the business partner so much more um, ability, I suppose, kind of cut different data sets and bring them together um, kind of in, in ways that you need them or want them to deliver real specific bits for your business areas. But I think it also means that well, I, speaking to myself only, have had to really restructure and rethink um, about how I use my time because actually I'm not a data expert by nature. So actually having to deal with a new way of kind of um, finding that data and interpreting it for myself means I need to give it more time and I need to have, I suppose, more time with HRVP colleagues to talk about how they're using their data and if there are other kind of ways to look at things that I've not considered yet. So I would say even in the last six 12 months data and analytics and access to both of those things have really kind of changed the way that I work in my HRVP role. That's really interesting. Thanks, Laura. It's fascinating. Um, Kevin. Uh, yeah, hi. I'm and funnily enough, actually, I work for the same I've worked for the same employer as, as Laura does. So I'm not going to echo too much what she said, but I've I've been in the civil service for a while and I've been a business partner for our three departments in the civil service over about the last seven or eight years and and i think what's been clear is we've always been very good at collecting data and then not really doing anything with it and i think there's a real shift now and not just where me and laura work but i've seen it from from other departments as well there is a real shift now to try and use the data that we already collect more intelligently to feed into those kind of conversations and those decisions and that's great i think the challenge we're face and at the moment certainly what I'm experiencing is the level of data we get and having to kind of 
wade through it to pick out the stuff that actually tells you something worth knowing and and i think we're very much where like i said where i work at the moment and, and other departments i know very much still at an early stage where we're still getting quite mature in how we use that data and, and i think we you know it's going to be a little bit of trial and error probably over the next 18 months i mean it's a real hot topic where we are at the minute like laura's just been saying um but i think we've we've still got a bit of pain to go through where we we get the right data and use it for the right decisions and i don't think i don't think we're quite there yet yeah it's really interesting isn't it that idea that there's um i, I didn't cover it but i think there's um there's more um essentially that there's more data available now than ever before and it's this kind of avalanche of, of data um, and actually whether it's us in our, our roles or skills I think as someone's just mentioned in the chat or organizations at large there's a real maturity question isn't there about do do we understand this are we ready to, to use it and, and how best do we will we harness it um Carrie what do you think yeah, so I've met someone before before. I work for the Office of National Statistics, so probably not too surprisingly, I thought it was near the top. Um, but the challenge we have in my team is that um, we work with statistical and data experts all the time. And what we see with the business is that they want to throw more and more data at us and get us to kind of go further and further into data analysis, um, which is unhelpful because one, it sort of hides the issue because they just want to go down to the nth degree. Um, and means that we don't get to the point which is actually meaningful, which is what are we going to do about it? So we spend too much time, I think, focusing on what's the data telling us and much less time applying our HR knowledge to say, actually, based on what the data is telling me and what I've seen working in other organisations or what I know has worked in another area of the business or what I've thought about because of a I don't know, CIPD event I've just been to, here's what we could do about it. So I think there's a temptation to absolutely there's a need for HR business partners to build skills in data and analytics. And my team wouldn't be credible if we didn't do that. And luckily, we have great experts to work with to help us do that. But where we add the value is by saying, actually, and here's what we can do about it, because that's the bit that the business doesn't necessarily have the experience or the expertise in. Yeah, definitely. I think that's that's really important. Um, I, I want to move us through to, to some of the next slides to see see where we're at, but I, but I I don't think we can quite. Sorry, Anna. Sorry. <laughs> um, move off without talking about climate change. Um, just very brief. I mean, we we think this is going to be um, just a, a really emergent subject that's going to have a, a, a big impact, certainly through 2025 and, and 2030. Does anyone have a view? Is it, has anyone's organisation um, uh, been doing anything or is this particularly relevant to anybody and, and, and have you seen any impacts yet? No worries, if not, we can we can kind of move through and be on notice that it's uh, it's coming. Um, Okay, and we part of climate change. Let's move through. Um, okay, the trends that are most important. So we've got interesting chief people architect, stripey team leader, macro social forecaster, Spencer. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. So with the um, with the stripey team leader piece, do people find? I think my question on that is: is are people seeing that this is something that's happening already? Um, is it something that sounds a bit bonkers or, or are you finding actually there is a bit of a, um, a, a mixed sort of um, matrix or, or, or hybrid teams going on within the HR function? Any views on that or any views on, on any of this, frankly, if anyone's got any points they want to make? We're definitely seeing that at, um, at MasterCard. Um, I think we, we, we tend to have groups of people all working together whether it's in data or finance or in product, et cetera, we, we do tend to then pull teams together quite well. Um, we've had some help with getting those sort of the talent marketplace. I mean, Gloat is one of those that that's been quite helpful in, in getting some of those multidisciplinary groups together, but we, we've certainly started to move down that route. So that's actually a really interesting point um, around product. Um, so this is where we most see some of those stripey teams emerging, where organisations are starting to move into portfolio based or product based operating models. So actually organising themselves around products um, and then plugging in the right capability needed to deliver the, the, 
develop and deliver the life cycle of a product um, is really interesting. And it's interesting, I'll, I'll just drop this in to think about it. It's interesting from an HR perspective, if you kind of reimagine the HR functions and move away from what you know about centres of expertise and business partners and, and systems and talent acquisition, whatever it might be, into actually um, what if we organise the HR function around our products? and then or portfolios for example and say uh, we had a joint portfolio that was responsible for kind of attraction uh, retention onboarding and first kind of 100 days you could be a business partner in that team you could be part of employee relations or reward or talent acquisition but actually you've broken off the traditional model you're organized around some products and portfolios and and you you have that stripey team um I can't see any more hands, so let's move to the last one, Anna. Let's see how we're doing. There we go. Oh, pretty good. Look at this. So, um, a two is a two is um medium. Medium, yeah. A two is present. So, and actually, if we're above two, then we're moving into some of these future trends. So. This is really interesting um, to see some of that um, coming through, especially to people architect. So it's good that that's um, that's kind of already there, and people are feeling good about automation. And so I think it's how many people have chosen have fallen down. Mm. We're not sure what the graph says. Sorry, <laughs> we're having a moment. How many people is the number, and then the sort of wave? Oh, uh, the wave. The wave is where we are. Is where okay. we are. Fine. There's still some good good progress through the through the, to the to present day, which is which is really encouraging. Are there any more thoughts? I can't see any more hands. So perhaps Richard, we move into Q and A. Yeah, there's, there's a, please do put, uh, raise your hand for uh, questions generally. But there are two on the chat. I'd like to draw on, if I may. Um, <laughs> this is putting people on the spot today. Um, Breeda Breeda O'Connor Connor asks uh, the HRBP of the future. Um, how does that link to HR opportunities and shared service? Bridget, are you there? Just to sort of tell us a bit more about that, if you would. And then I wanted to go to Jen Lawrence after that, if I may, Jen. But Brida first, if you're there. Maybe, oh, maybe we lost her. I'll come back to that. Jen, could I turn to you instead? Because you were talking about two things, actually. Um, is data uh, the skill gap of the moment and that's why it's voted so high as it were and secondly um <laughs> glenn you're gonna like this um taking out the bp role um and how that might work yes sure so um let's start so i just sometimes wonder when we're all going oh gosh this is the next big thing it's because it's something that doesn't sit in the current um business partnering toolkit particularly well and i get super frustrated because i think the hr systems to support that are not there and they're certainly behind the times um i use um kind of i've, I've seen little ones like hi bob and um, I'm currently using people HR and to be honest it's really hard to get really good data and analytics out of that to support the BP role so that's where I, I kind of sense that we're not always being helped as much as we need it um, and then just controversially I just thought I'd chuck that one in there so um, admittedly it was on the back of Covid and um, Virgin as probably many know are always on the radical side of life but we basically found that some of the skills in the BP role make them a bit octopus and they were being spread in lots of different directions. So actually by splitting out and almost going right, you, uh, there's a team that are really good at doing people experience and thinking about the customer and the, the people experience. Let's look at a team for that. We looked at a team who did OD and they became experts at that um, and so forth. So we were still getting the insights but we were actually learning it in different ways. And I don't know, because I've left um, Virgin um, since, but uh, I think they were they were mucking around with that model to see if that worked. So I just wanted to share those two bits, really. Yeah, really, really interesting. Um, and a great, it's great to ask those kind of pr provocative questions. I think one of the questions I get asked quite a bit is, it, or one of the thoughts that I, I know we talked about um, from a Deloitte perspective it, is actually, it, do we see all of these business partnering functions coming together? So rather than actually what is a, a sort of a, a functional silo of, of, of perhaps HR, finance in particular, and then some of the other business partnering areas, is it possible to create a, um, a, a generic business partnering role that actually is is a true 
high level business partner and at the most kind of senior level and um, to be able to be across all of those those functions and, and i think it's interesting when you start to try and think well what does that look like for the organization that has to sit below it which is is kind of interesting to to what you're saying i, I think one of the challenges probably um of getting rid of the business partner role is um the customer interface um and and the local knowledge it's interesting to hear that that you're talking about a customer experience team that perhaps i don't know if you mean Virgin's customers, or if, in, if that means internal customers, but I think that's it was the big, both actually. Both, yeah. It was the both because what we were noticing was that we were getting problems that came up through the customer channel. So, for example, if you went on a flight, it was how was that training and development supporting the customer experience? So we were trying to join the two together. We called it a helix actually. So you had insight from customer at the same time as you're getting insights from I don't know. I think they were using Humo. It was like a custom. Uh, sorry. A, an employee survey tool. So you were joining bits up the ladder the whole time and trying to get things meeting. Um, and I think one of the reasons we took it out was because quite honestly, the business parts were being a bit abused by the, the, the customers uh, internally, like as in managers going, oh, can you just do this for me? And the HR model was slightly bending itself because they were forever trying to solve the problem rather than get the root cause addressed. And that's something I still think the business partnering function struggles with a bit actually if I'm honest because you're on the heat and the face of things that are broken and then you can get the system behind it to work fast enough and I think by dividing it out we had a little bit of a different approach to that. Yeah definitely it's really it's a really interesting approach to that um, problem that I think we've all probably experienced and um, the other option and, and this is a 45 minute presentation in itself as you can probably see from this slide but just just popping this up this is an example that we used within Deloitte of a, pr a product based operating model for HR and you'll observe quite quickly that there isn't necessarily a business partner role and um, leadership advisory is perhaps the neatest um, place it would fit but if you kind of look to the center where it says join experience plan and perform that's your organization. So that's what I was talking about around portfolios um, and actually within each of these portfolios, the, the HR function is responsible for producing and iterating and constantly improving products that serve that portfolio. So there'll be business partner type capabilities across all of those, but I think that's another good way to kind of break some of those traditional HR silos that we see. And I love your description about um, which I bet everyone on the call recognises this. Um, getting a little bit octopus. I think that's um, that's a lovely way of putting it. Um, let's go down. Uh, let's go across to uh, to Kyla for one last question, if I may. Kyla, thank you. Hi, it's really interesting. I was about to say something, and then you, it's on your slide. Um, so it's I often think about the HR business partner role to avoid that kind of octopusness um, as an account manager. So it's just in that bottom right hand box of your slide there, because I think everything you've said in terms of the trends and needs and skills, it's very difficult for one person to have an in-depth working knowledge of all of those things. And I do wonder if we're moving towards, and particularly again, what you said about our consumer experience and how we want to be treated like customers. I think our business areas, or however you cut up your business in terms of providing support, also want to be treated like customers. They want bespoke tools, systems, methodologies for them to make their bit of the business work better. And I think the account management model is possibly the next, a better iteration rather of the business partnering model. So it's taking the best, and that's why I talk to my team about, is about being brand ambassadors for our whole function. So knowing enough about all of it to go and sell it effectively and bringing in a sales skill and then um, but and connecting the experts with the operators um, so that that you 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 bring them in, you play them in when required. So I think an account management type mentality might be a new way of thinking about business partnering. Not that I've particularly implemented that, I have to be honest, but that's just what I'm thinking about at the moment. Yeah, and I think there's a really interesting point there about one of the things I often say, people say to me, oh, you know, what's um, what stays the same then if everything is going to change? And, and I do think it's for the business partner role, I would I often talk about the, what I call the margin of humanity. So as much as, as technology pushes up the, the floor of, of what we do, there's always this 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 kind of 
margin, um, which is the human bit. And, and essentially what we're talking about there is um, what you're looking for interpreters and translators of what's going on in, in the world and, and what's impacting the world and impacting people, because most of our businesses are run on people. Um, so we need that insight into what does that therefore mean for our, our workforce? And that's kind of the business I see as the business partner margin of humanity type of role. That's a nice way of putting it. Like, 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 Carla, thanks for that question. I love your idea about the uh, account management skill set that makes a lot of sense and brand ambassador of the function. Well, we're just up uh, to the, the time now, so it's very nice to see you all. Um, Glenn, thank you ever so much for all that richness, and there's even more in the book. We'll send the link out to the book. Anna, colleague Anna, thank you for your help too with Mentimeter and others. Um, everyone's got a peer conversation before we break for the summer, each each of the networks. In fact, the HRBP one is actually on data analytics, so we hope to see yeah. you there. Uh, Glenn, thank you again, and we'll see you all soon. Then stay on, see the feedback. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. That was really interesting.